Okay, so now we get into another integration issue. One that you're going to face on a daily basis. And in many ways, this ends up being the most important. Well, there are two most important things in integration. The first important thing is integrating your interest in God. Okay, when, it's, when you're integrating an interest in something, what that means is you have all kinds of other things in your life that sort of have to fit around the thing you're more interested in. Like, for example, if, you're, uh, if, if your husband, you're you, and then you're also a husband, and then you also have a wife you're interested in, and children you're interested in, and a job you're interested in because of the wife and children often. Sometimes you're interested in the job even without the wife and kids. It depends. Usually it's a combination of the two. So you see, that's an integration. You're integrating yourself as a human being with your role as a husband, with your interest in your wife, with your interest in your kids, with your interest in your job, and with the duties of your job, you get interested in your job because of your wife and kids. So you see, when things are integrated, they go back and forth. They feed off each other. Okay. So interest is first. Without the interest, there's no integration at all. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what you can do. It doesn't matter what your abilities are. But if you are interested, then there's the question of right, wrong, and incompetence. Okay. You don't, if you're interested in somebody, or even yourself, you're interested in being competent. And of course, depending on how hard it is to be competent, your interest is going to rise or fall. If something's too hard to do, you stop trying to be competent in it. Alright? And in the process of trying to be competent, there's a lot of stuff that you got to learn. Pros and cons, pluses and minuses, facts. Okay? And, like, let's say you're interested in learning about cars. Okay, well, then you got to get into what's a carburetor, what's a piston, you know, what's gas, what does it actually do, what's a differential, what's a transmission. And if it gets too boring to you to learn all of those facts, then your interest in the car, in learning cars, might still be present, but it's going to be too low to result in your gaining competence in learning cars. So interest drives your desire for competence. Okay? By the same token, the uh, difficulty in becoming competent is going to affect your level of interest. And in some cases, in practically all cases really, your interest is going to have to rise above your level of incompetence in order to get further competence in doing whatever that thing is. It's the same, only much more so, with God. There's a lot of what the world considers to be boring and irrelevant information that the world will tell you you don't really need to learn because it's not interested. But there's a lot of information about God to learn that doesn't seem like it's going to result in learning about God himself. Okay? And a whole lot of people just learn a whole lot of information in the Bible because it makes them feel like they're smart because they know something. They're not interested in God. They're interested in being able to say they know something. And that gives them a sense of competence because they're interested in being able to look at themselves in the mirror and think well of themselves. Or have other people look at them and think well of them. You see the, the difference? You can attain a kind of competence for the wrong reasons or due to interests that really are not going to be in your best, um, your own best interest. Okay. People do things, they learn things, they become competent in things based on their interests. But if their interests aren't, as it were, in the right direction, then the kind of competence they have or the reason for becoming competence is going to be misaligned. And what's going to end up happening is that there's going to be a whole lot of frustration. And that's basically the story of life. 
Okay, a lot of things in this life, I gotta tell you, I am not interested in. I'm just not. You can argue all day about whether I ought to be, but I'm not. Okay, but if there is something I am interested in, which is related to something I'm not interested in, and I need to learn a thing I'm not interested in in order to get the thing that I am interested in, well, then I'll do it. And that's typical of any human. Like, let's say you're a kid, and you've got peas on your plate, and you've got ice cream off on the side. You want the ice cream, but your mother says you've got to eat the peas in order to eat the ice cream first. You've got to eat the peas first. Okay, well, you don't like peas even if you've never tried them. But you are going to have a modicum of interest in eating the peas, not because of the peas, but because of the ice cream. So the ice cream is actually driving your desire to eat the peas. You see that? That's an integration. You are now integrating the eating of peas with the eating of the ice cream, and it's the ice cream that's determining your desire to eat the peas. It's the same thing with God. In this world, we start out, everything is horizontal, and all of our interests, whatever they end up being, are pretty much um, expressed as and f function as interests in the world. God is a part of, part of the world to us. He's a name, he's a person in the world. Even if we think we're positive to him, he's part of a horizontal life we're really living. As long as that's the case, then knowing God is something that does not happen. In order to want to, in order for for knowing God to occur, God has to be more important to you, like the ice cream. In other words, spiritual maturation is essentially that because of God, you know, God is equated with ice cream here. Because of God, you want to eat the green peas of life. Everything is based on your interest in God at the end. But in the beginning, you don't even know who God is, so how are you going to get interested? You see the point? So the whole integration process is to integrate who you are with everything around you and with God, with the end result goal ideally being that because of God you want anything or everything else. That it, it, Like the ice cream, it drives your desire. What you know about God, the fact that you know God, drives your desire for everything else. That's why Christ could stay on the cross sinless. That's why Christ could avoid sin. His interest in Father exceeded his interest in everything else. And that's why he talks about things like, well, you've got to learn to carry your cross. In other words, because he's so interested in Father, and notice I'm not saying love, I'm saying interest. Because love is essentially interest. Okay? He's so interested in God, his whole desire to live is based on knowing Father. And then everything else integrates up into some aspect of his knowing of Father. That's why he was able to go to the cross, and that's why we can have one. So when your interest in God grows, you get little things that happen to you that conflict with the interest in God. Like, let's say you're on a highway and you just finished, you know, getting some gas for your car and you start to drive the car out. This actually happened to me. And then the car dies because it turns out that it wasn't really gasoline you put in your car, that somebody had put too much water in the gas tank. And so when you poured that gas into your car, you ended up putting water in your gas tank. Well, now that's, that makes for a bad day. Now you have this conflict between your interest in God and your irritation over, you know, what's happening to you laterally. Okay, for however, however long it lasts and whatever much it costs. It's taking time out. It's preventing you from getting whatever you had in mind for that day done or it's wrecking or you know reducing the ability that you have to get anything done so now your eyes and your interests are focused on your problem and it's a question of well can interest in God be more important than the problem because God did allow it and for a lot of people that's you know stuff like that is just too much 
why did God let this happen to me? And you can pick something as small as, you know, water in your gas tank, or pick something as big as a holocaust. And it's the same question. Something bad happens to you. Why did God let it happen if he loves you? Okay? Now, even if you're interested in God, that question is going to hit your mind. And it's normal that it do. So there's a conflict between your interest in doing whatever it is you're doing with your lateral body that day and how well you know God. And you can even argue that, well, see, now I have less time for Bible study because I had this problem with the water in my gas tank. And then what about all those people in the Holocaust? What time for Bible study do they have? None. Why were they tortured like that? It's a good question. Okay? And you've got that, this whole panoply, this whole spectrum of stuff that interferes with the interests you have. And God lets it happen. Why? Because if you're interested in somebody else or something else, especially somebody else, you come to need or want them to be interested in you as well. I mean, basically that's how things work. I mean, if you're interested in a thing, well, the thing can't respond. But if you're interested in a person, chances are real good that, that you kind of want that person to be interested in you as well. If for no other reason because you want to be around that person. Okay, sometimes it doesn't work that way. A lot of people are interested in a one unidirection. They don't need you to be interested in them in, in return. But there's, there's a, a sort of natural reciprocal need in humans. Okay? It, it's not always there. Sometimes you're just interested in doing something for somebody and you don't need them to be interested in you in reply. But you also don't particularly, you wouldn't expect them to be hostile to you in reply. So that's a sort of reciprocation issue. So all these things come into integration. Now, the point of this audio was to, first of all, introduce this fact that you've got interest as the integration issue. But the second thing, and the main point of the audio was, that you got facts about the thing or person you're interested in that you need to learn in order to gain competence in knowing that thing or person that you're interested in. And if it's too hard to learn, then that's a test of how much interest you've got. Your interest has to rise above the difficulty. Your interest has to rise above your level of competence in knowing or doing. And that's how this tandem thing works. The interest is first, it's the driver. But then if that doesn't result in you also learning the facts about that thing or person, then you're not really integrating your life with respect to that thing or person. Or your interest is very low after all. It's high so long as it doesn't cost you any time or effort. But once it starts costing you time or effort, well then your interest wanes. And of course that's the way all romance is. You know, any kind of friendship or romance is always tested on that. How difficult is it to have that relationship? The same thing is true for a job. You might be interested in becoming a doctor until you find out how hard it is. And then the, can your interest overcome the difficulty in learning all the things you got to learn to become a doctor? Okay, well, this is especially that question with God. You're interested in God. Most everybody is at least a little bit interested in God. And that's pretty much as far as it goes. Once they start getting into what scripture is, and all these details, and all these words, and all these terms from the past that don't have any bearing on anything going on today once they start realizing how much they have to learn then they start questioning whether that's going to help them learn anything about God at all because they don't they don't recognize why it's important and then their interest stops okay the same thing is true with other relationships in life, which is what Christ was talking about with the cross thing. Is that 
you got other relationships in life, and if you're really interested in God, you're going to have to sort of pare down the time you spend on other things and other people in order to spend more time learning God. Okay? And to the degree that you are willing to do that, that's how much interest you have in God, really. Because it's a long learning curve. Really long learning curve. You sit in Bible class day in, day out, day in, day out. You end up learning a lot of vocabulary for the most part that doesn't seem to be relevant. Okay? And then depending on the pastor that you've got teaching you, either he does explain it well or he doesn't explain it well, or he does explain it well, but you don't understand it because there's so much more you got to understand before you understand the first thing he said. You know, because he's busy talking about something that's, you know, essentially at the level of differential calculus, and you still need to know 1 plus 1 equals 2. Do you tune out at that point? Do you get bored at that point? Do you quit at that point? And the answer is all of us do. It's not so much a question of quitting or tuning out that moment, but after you've tuned out, you get back in. That would be the interest governing, driving you to get back up and do it again. And then you, just like exercising a muscle, you exercise it and, okay, I'm tired, I don't want to do it anymore. Okay, but then after about five minutes, ten minutes, the next day, okay, I want to do it again. So, I want to do it again is the level, is your interest overcoming your incompetence. See, I, I say that because this is a process. And in Christianity, altogether, we have this very childish idea about spirituality. One of which is, is that if you backslide or you quit, that that means, you know, you're a bad person. No. It means you got tired. Your level of interest, you topped out. Your level of interest today in learning God topped out. Okay, but do you get up tomorrow? Do you get up five minutes from now? You know, use 1 John 1 9, yeah, Dad, I just, I got bored. And you get back into it, and you do it over, and over, and over, and as you can probably guess, this is true of everything in life. So the same mechanics in the same body that you live every single day are either being lived toward a progressive desire to know God or not. And even the progressive desire to know God, it rises, it falls. It rises, it tires, it falls. Every day, like breathing. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's no, there's no place for shame in the spiritual life. There's no place for guilt. There's no, it's like high, this is a fundamentally impossible relationship to start with. Do you want to know yes or no? Don't fault yourself if you say, if you don't know, if you don't want to know. It's true. Admit it. Move on. Okay, I didn't want to know you, God, five minutes ago. Okay, but I changed my mind now. Okay, so change your mind and learn again. That's what 1 John 1 9 is for. It's a license to grow. Okay? And the same thing holds true for somebody else who's in your periphery. A license to grow. Your interest and their interest on the same doctrine at the same time are not necessarily going to be the same. So you're more interested than them on doctrine A, and they're more interested than you on doctrine B. So you tire out and quit, and they go on. And then on some other doctrine, you, you don't tire out, and they do. So, do you deal with the tensions in your relationship as a result of that differential between you? And the answer is going to be, yeah, you're going to get tired, you're going to get frustrated, you're going to even maybe get angry and have an argument. And then there's five minutes, ten minutes the next day, and you kiss and make up. Same thing is true with God. Okay. So now we talk about this question of you got interest leading you to want to become competent, which requires you learning stuff that doesn't seem related or is very annoying. 
And does your interest keep driving you, even though it fails and it rises again and it fails and it rises again, does it keep driving you to learn more stuff about God? Okay? On the flip side, which is the point of this audio, what is it that you're learning when you're learning? Because it matters altogether what you learn in order to fuel, like food, your desire to know God. See, they, they interact. This is integration also. The integration between the desire to know and then the resultant learning. But the resultant learning is going to be very much impacted by what it is you're learning about God every day. Now, the biggest problem there is that, especially the way the Bible is taught, whether it's in a seminary or, or, you know, in a pulpit, a lot of the way the Bible is taught makes God boring. Or they, they opt for Mr. Emotion, where they do the rah-rah Jesus songs for 20 minutes out of the 60 minutes you're in church. And then they have a collection plate which takes another 20 minutes. And then all the final 20 minutes you got the pastor spending 10 of his 20 minutes standing up there and shuffling his papers and announcing whatever it is for the community of the church. The, you know, some kind of uh, social event. And then he spends maybe 10 minutes actually giving you some information. How's that information going to feed your interest? Generally speaking, it doesn't. So what happens in your typical Christian church is they go to make themselves feel good about themselves and they consider themselves, well, if I went, I did my good deed. You know, we get that for us an overhang from the Catholics because they call going to Mass a sacrament. So you consider it your good deed for the week if you went to church. But your interest in God did not get fed. Now, that's not true for all pastors. Sometimes the pastor's actually talking for 60 minutes. Okay, but nobody's listening. Because they're not interested. They're sitting there to say that they did their sacrament for the week. I went to church. I'm a good person. God should bless me. They're not interested in God. They're only going there because that's, to them, church is their green peas. And the ice cream is what they really want to be blessed. And God isn't in it at all. So God is like green peas to them. Whether the pastor is a good one or not. Whether he's talking really about Bible or not. And whether he's giving you information which ought to increase your interest in God or not. So that's the problem. Now... Let's pretend that you're one of those and you're going to be like, it's like 1% of any congregation is actually seriously interested. Let's pretend you're that 1% that's in the serious interested category. But now let's pretend that the pastor, for whatever his reasons, is not doing too good himself on a certain topic in Scripture. And so he teaches you a lot of wrong information, which you don't know is wrong because you're there to learn from him. That wrong information is going to have something related to right information, so God can use it to steer you in the right direction anyway. But let's pretend you actually believe the wrong information in spite of all the warning signals you're going to get. Now all of a sudden you got wrong information about God that you're believing in and liking and choosing. It's no longer the pastor's fault because you chose to, to learn it and you chose to like it. Now your interest in God is going to get skewed. Okay. And now the kind of person that you're calling God really isn't God to that extent. And so you're now, your interest is skewing and your competence, of course, is going down. But you don't know that. The information that you think you're learning that makes you feel good 
or makes you think that you're interested in God except it's not really God anymore is something that you're clinging to instead that's a real hard thing to deal with okay and this is this is a major flaw in Christianity today is that if you're interested in knowing God he's gonna steer you clear of and alert you to information being taught about him which is incorrect because if you're interested in knowing him you're interested in knowing him however he really is and if there's information being said about him and you have to be listening to it and it's wrong he's gonna let you know but if you're buying into the information about him that's wrong mistakenly or because you just like it then that creates a problem because now you're buying information that's not true of God as if it were true of God and he's alerting you to the fact that it's not true and you're not paying attention or you're not listening so now you're being negative to the person you're otherwise positive to you see how that works now it depends on the facts and circumstances just how bad this can get but it can get pretty bad for example you got a whole bunch of really really honestly you know sincere Catholics Mormons Calvinists they really think they love God they really think they're interested in God okay and there are a whole bunch of things that are in each of those denominations that are claimed of God that are just flat wrong but they've come to associate those ideas with God and all the warnings in the world throughout the centuries have not penetrated their awareness so now they're going after a hallucinated idea of God that they're still interested in, that they're still striving to be competent in. And, you know, you have to really argue that the people who are the most, the, the saddest situations among them are among the leaders. And so I, I can't imagine that a person can be, you know, um, a leader in, say, Catholicism or Mormonism or Calvinism and not himself be deluded I mean because that, that's not an occupation you do just to get the money and the approbation is it okay I mean where's the where's the real benefit there so they actually have very strong hallucinations about the character and nature of God which because they believe in those hallucinations so much they sell to their congregations and the congregations end up believing in them too that in many ways is the most tragic of situations to be chasing a windmill idea of God and it's not him you know whether you're talking Mariolatry in the Catholic Church or you're talking you know um, a lot of its false doctrines like purgatory um, or that you have to do the sacraments in order to be spiritual or you know you're talking about the Calvinists who are all big on saying that you know Christ only paid for the elect totally misunderstanding grace totally misunderstanding sovereignty and totally misunderstanding sin these people really believe what they're doing now notice what I'm trying to say here your interest in God can be hijacked by incorrect information that you become competent in. See, interest leads to a desire for competence. Competence leads to a desire that's tested, as it were, for how hard are you willing to fight to actually become competent. And that's where your interest is the driver. But at the same time, if the information that you're learning and becoming competent in is not doesn't fit then you're becoming competent in an illusion and your interest is still there but is off track now onto an illusion 
Uh, I, I bring that up because the biggest problem we have in Christianity and really pretty much everywhere else is that people are integrating their ideas of God with lies. And they're interested in those lies. And they get plenty of warning along the way throughout their lives that that's what's happening to them. And because they've become competent in the lies, they mistake the lies as being truth and they mistake specifically the lies about God as being true of God and their interest is really in the lies which they put God's name on it and therefore they honestly believe that they're interested in God. So on the one hand the interest is the driver and on the other hand it's the victim. So as you try to be interested in God and you start to learn the number one thing you need to do to protect your interest and protect integrating in the right direction so you're really integrating with God instead of a lie is you got to keep asking God if what you're learning about him is true okay even if you're sure it's true ask because whatever you know that's true about him isn't as true as you need to know okay the minute you start like getting oh not necessarily proud but confident that what you know about him is true you're susceptible to this skewing of the interest into falsehood because what happens is competence has its own pleasures competence has its own um, advantages and then you become in love with the competence rather than in love with the object of the competence here, God. And you become, as it were, dependent on for your happiness. You become dependent on your competence. And therefore your interest in God is sort of being hijacked to your interest in being competent. All right? And therefore you lose your competence. Okay, and here's a real good example of that. Um, forever and ever and ever, the Calvinists and the have been fighting with like the the oneness crowd, the apostolic crowd, about over whether God is one or three. Okay, it doesn't even make any sense that God would be one person. You know, salvation wouldn't work. There's no social life then if God is the only one of His own kind. None of that will none of that will work. There'd be no happiness. Okay? That's just flat obvious before you even start. There has to be more than one person as God or salvation doesn't work. Because Christ has to be God man in order for to be able to pay God at his own level for sins. Period. He's gotta have that quality to him. Or there's no payment on the cross. Period. If Christ is just a man, there's no payment on the cross, it's a sham. Okay, so Christ has to be God. Well, he can't be the only one who's God, because what does he do? As a, as a human, he hangs on the cross and goes, <laughs> then he goes running up to heaven to receive the payment for the sins, announced and paid, and goes back down to the cross? That didn't happen. You see? Well, but then he has to be God-man, so then there has to be another God, who's already, as it were, up in heaven, receiving the payment of his thinking, and pronouncing it paid. Okay, well, if there's two, then there really has to be three, because if Christ, in his own godness, ensures his own sinlessness, then he's cheating. Then it's really not his humanity that's paying. Okay, it'd be like your son going into the grocery store and taking out your credit card to pay for the groceries, and then the son pretending he's the one who paid. Okay? You're paying from a different source of money that's not your money. In other words, humanity's money has to pay for humanity's sin. So in his humanity, he has to pay for sin. So if he reaches into his godness pocket, so to speak, and pulls out his godness credit card, 
then it's not the humanity that's paying. So there has to be a third God. You got that. Now, most Trinitarians kind of figure that out throughout the centuries. I mean, they don't necessarily word it the way I just did. But they sort of figured out that salvation wouldn't theoretically work unless God were three. And there's no point to being God if you're all by yourself. That would be the worst torture of all. That's why we know Islam is wrong. That's why we know the apostolics are wrong. Okay, but when the... When the Trinitarians argue with the Apostolics, they're all busy using their little academic statements. They're not basing it on the character of God. So, a good example of how you can get so hung up on your competence that it stops being about God and your interest gets skewed is that one. When you listen to the apostolics argue with the Trinitarians and the Trinitarians argue with the apostolics, they're all looking at each other and God is just a, a name that's slapped on. Nobody's talking about the character of God himself. Even if they're using his words a lot and even if they're using the Bible a lot, it's not even about him. It's about so-and-so, dear Dr. So-and-so with his credentials versus dear Dr. So-and-so with his credentials. And I'm quoting this scripture and you're quoting this scripture. And look at how, we can, how smart we are. And of course the debate never gets resolved either. That's a real trap as you're growing up in Christ. Is to misintegrate. Misintegrate. You integrate the stuff you're learning, which is driven by your interest, and if the stuff you're learning is wrong and you don't pay attention because you're asking God because you're interested in Him, Hi God, it's what I'm learning about you correct and my thinking correctly about you. Because you care about Him, see? You care about what you're thinking. You care about being competent because you care about Him. If that is driving you, you will keep asking the question. If that is not driving you, you won't keep asking the question. You'll start to get hung up on how competent you are. So if you catch yourself getting hung up on how competent you are, or you notice other people being hung up on how competent they are, then you know that's an example of misintegration. It doesn't mean they don't care about God, but they've gotten sidetracked. And 99% of Christianity is in that boat. I mean, how many people do you know who are Christians who would actually say to you, oh, I don't care about God? Nobody. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, hi, I want to be disinterested in God today. Not even the atheist does that. So how is it that we get it all so screwed up? This is how. We misintegrate. Granted, most of us, our knowledge level and our interest level in God is very close to zero, but it isn't zero. Even the atheist is more interested in God than zero. But where does it go from there? What kind of interest is it? Is it an interest in God so you can debate? Is it an interest in God so you can be competent? In other words, God's the green peas and your ice cream is something else? Or is God the ice cream? If God is the ice cream, then whatever you're learning about him, you're learning it in order to know him. And what you are going to be concerned about is, am I learning this tr correctly? Okay? In the next increment, we're going to go through this a little bit more because the whole process of integration with God really centers on being interested in him and talking to him. Above all, talking to him. And that's what we'll pick up in the next increment.